everyone as you're joining coming into our webinar. Um, my name's Laura uh, and I'm from Snowball. And we're really delighted to team up with Bethnal Green Ventures to bring you this conversation on next gen impact investing. So we'll just kind of give it a few minutes as people are arriving, but thank you to everyone uh, and to our panel uh, for joining what we think will be really hopeful way to kind of round out the year and think about who's going to be pioneering impact in 2021. So uh, we'll kick off by introducing Snowball and BGV, um, but we'll just to kind of note a couple of things. So we'll share this recording um, afterwards and please do ask loads of questions as we get going. So anything we don't get to, uh, we'll, we'll come to later and try and answer after the event. Um, we'll drop our contact details in the chat in a moment so that we can kind of keep in touch with you and answer any of those questions we didn't get to. So uh, looks like we've got quite a lot of people arriving. So Snowball. Uh, at Snowball, we're on a mission to create behavior change in financial markets. So ultimately, we want all capital to be invested for impact. So to create this kind of level of change, we're structured in a really broad way and in a way that we think makes it as straightforward as possible to connect capital with impact. We're a fund of funds, uh, kind of fully diversified. So we're operating across asset classes uh, in public and private markets. Uh, and across the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So because of this big behavior change in investment that we want to create, the way that we operate ourselves is really important to us. So for example, um, our founding investor team are not for profit entities or kind of um, not for distribution and we're a certified B Corporation. But I really wanna kind of get started with thinking about what the panel um, are gonna say about the next gem. Uh, I mean, personally, I'm really interested in just what makes a person a pioneer. So I've been thinking running up to this event about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and it wasn't until she was in her mid thirties that she really started thinking about the kind of like more active equality work that she wanted to do because the students that she was kind of teaching were putting pressure on her to not accept the status quo any longer. But she still looked at the generation before her of women who'd gone previously as a kind of blueprint for the change that she wanted to create. So maybe there's just something in there for all of us in that kind of intergenerational relay as we think about how we can all accelerate the movement towards investing for impact next year. So I'll hand over to Paul. Uh, he'll introduce BGB and our moderator. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been great to do this with Snowball. We, we love working with Snowball. Um, so yeah, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, my name's Paul. I help run uh, Bethnal Green Ventures. We're um, Europe's leading tech for good VC firm. So uh, we're early stage investors in what we call tech for good businesses. That's impact businesses that are using technology to solve problems in uh, a sustainable planet, uh, healthy lives, and a, and a better society. Um, we've been going since 2012, invested in well over 100 companies now. Um, so we're much more kind of sort of a small part of this than, than, than Snowball, who are across the whole of impact investing. Uh, but I think it's nonetheless really interesting to family offices, it turns out. We've certainly seen a lot of family offices uh, making investments into our portfolio companies, which we think is really interesting. Um, and a lot more interest over time from family offices in impact and, and tech for good. So we're delighted to be uh, co-hosting this event today. We'll, I'll, I'll disappear in a moment and, and hand over to the panel because they're, they're the ones you're really here for. And um, to host our panel, I'm delighted to introduce um, Amanda Feldman, um, who is a real guru on particularly on impact management and, uh, and measurement. Uh, and is also my boss because uh, Amanda is a non-exec director of um, Bethnal Green Ventures. So um, I'll hand over to Amanda to introduce the rest of the panel. Um, and uh, yeah, please do feel to reach out to either Snowball or Bethnal Green Ventures after if you have any questions. And remember to drop your questions in the, in the Q&A as we go along as well. Okay, so I'll hand over to Amanda. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Laura. Uh, what a great setup for this panel uh, panel discussion we have today. Your 5,174th Zoom webinar uh, to everyone on the line, and we're really grateful that you could join us here um, as we close out 2020 with a, a really um, exciting group of of people thinking about what Laura and Paul just mentioned around how do we invest for impact, right? How do we invest more and more for impact? And how do we back the companies and organizations who are trying to drive that in the world? 
with our skills, with our expertise, and also with the capital um, that we have access to. So we have a few great examples. We're going to kick off just hear a bit more about our panelists. As Laura and Paul said, please put any questions, any comments, any ideas into the Q&A throughout this entire session. There's not going to be a period of just Q&A. We would love to hear what you have to say throughout, and we'll weave it into conversation. Um, with that, I would love to first uh, ask Liesl Pritzker Simmons, uh, who's here with us as co founder and principal of the Blue Haven Initiative. Um, it's a single family office based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and one of the first single family offices to focus 100% uh, of their assets on impact investing. And Liesl, it would be great for you to set the stage here and let us know when you've gotten to 100%, but where did you start? thinking about the impact of your portfolio? Um, and how do you organize that in your mind when you think about all the different ways we can invest for impact and, and the resources that you have available? Um, sure, so it's great to be here. Thank you for, for having me. Um, and just sort of to, to give some context. So I am a, a third generation inheritor. Um, I come from a big business family in the US um, and I in a little bit uh, sort of special situation, I inherited 100% control of my assets when I was 21. So that I know is a little bit unusual, um, but gave me some freedom to kind of move quickly um, in this space. So uh, with that context, um, I think sort of the, the philosophical approach to building out the portfolio really stems from, uh, you know, just a slight tweak on, on, um, on what Laura was saying was that, you know, I believe that every investment has an impact, not just you know, the ones that have a positive impact or ones that like every investment is doing something out there in the world. And so if you start from that premise, just like every investment has a risk return profile, they all have some kind of an impact profile. So if we agree that that is true, then it's really about understanding, just as I want to know intimately the risks and, and return profile for my investments, I also want to know what the impact profile is. And some investments have more favorable impact profiles than other ones. Um, but so really kind of that was the kind of the philosophical mindset coming into it and saying, as we look at building out a diversified um, portfolio across asset classes, um, I also want to put this lens on the portfolio as well. And so that's kind of how we started was instead of necessarily looking at um, a sector target um, or a very particular uh, outcome that we were looking for, we actually really started with everything's got an impact. So first let's understand what the portfolio is already doing. What did I inherit? Then let's try to make that impact better without substantially um, sort of um, kind of screwing up the risk return profile as well. And what we found was that when we were intentional about that, we were able to find over time, we've been able to fill out all of the asset classes and sub asset classes with really interesting strategies and managers um, that are also kind of kind of looking across these different dimensions. Um, and then over the years, we've just refined it and refined it and gotten more specific about the areas that we got really excited to play in. So direct investing and blended finance have become a big part of this as well. Um, and, and looking then also at how our philanthropy dovetails into the investment work as well. Um, so that's sort of, it's kind of starting from that frame um, and then once you do that, you sort of have no choice, but to, you know, obviously you want, you want the best impact profile that you can with a good return, risk return profile. And some things are good at that and some things aren't and should be stay over in philanthropy. Um, but for the ones that, that we can find, um, that's, that's where we focus our investment portfolio. Love that. Thank you for making that sound so clear. When I imagine at 21, you were sort of thinking, how do I do and No, that? no, no. It was taken many, a long time and many, many, many people to help. So 
Yeah. yeah. And I think for many on the call, right, it's, it's really helpful to hear that it's not choosing one sector. It's not focusing on one asset class for you. For you, it was saying what's happening overall in the portfolio. How do we do less bad and more good? And really, I guess, creating the systems to, to understand that, as you said, really figuring out how you have the same level of detail you have on the financials. So it's, it's well, really and the thing is, you could, you certainly could, right, say that this is the area, like, I really very particularly care about, um, uh, you know, uh, adolescent girls, or I really particularly care about this type of education or, or future of work or skill sets, like, and then find investments around that, you you certainly could. We just started and, you know, 12 years ago, well, now it's 15 years ago, um, when we started doing all of this, we just wanted to keep the universe as, as broad as possible um, in terms of what we were, where, how we were selecting investments. So it, that's just our way, but there's other ways too. We love that. Thank you, Liesl. And Sam, I'm gonna to come to you next because you're the executive director of The Impact, uh, which is a global membership community of families committed to doing this, to aligning their assets with their values. Um, and you're also a board member of, of your own, your family's family office. Keller Enterprises as well. So when you hear Liesl talk about her approach to this, does that resonate with what you're seeing across the impact? And what's the role of, of family offices in particular in driving more impact investment? Thanks. Um, it, well, it certainly resonates. And I, I think I'm biased because much of what I learned about this market, I learned from Liesl and she's my boss <laughs> as a board member of the impact. So. Uh, Yes, I agree with her very, very <laughs> strongly. Um, and I, in all seriousness, I, I actually think that the the work that uh, Liesl and her husband Ian and their team have done are a, a fantastic case study of the role that uh, families are uniquely positioned to play in the market. And, um, you know, I think of three interrelated things. Uh, I think the first is just you know, I think about the market as a food chain of sorts. And, um, you know, every fund manager who today is managing a billion dollars of assets started out by managing, you know, $50 million of assets. And every company that is raising a billion dollars started out uh, as an idea with friends and families investing. And so uh, I think families are uniquely positioned to be those uh, those early funders because they have freedom to deploy their assets as they see fit and, and you know, in the best cases have uh, a nimbleness and a, a sense of purpose that directs them to uh, towards those kinds of investments. So at first, you know, playing that essential early funding role or funding smaller scale um, funds and ventures that of course may, uh, may grow to become much larger, but everybody's got to start somewhere and families are a great place to start. I think the second piece is um, kind of at the other end of the spectrum is really the, the unique uh, cultural and institutional influence that families have. And this is something that we've been really focused on with the impact um, over the last year, thinking about how we can mobilize both the, the again, the kind of public cachet, rightly or wrongly, that uh, wealthy families have, their ability to um, kind of set a tone that gets followed. Um, and privately, you know, families are clients or have special relationships with the larger institutions that shape so much of, uh, you know, how money moves in the world. And that's a real lever that we need to be pushing on. You know, families can drive change within larger institutions to raise standards within those institutions. Uh, and then I think the third thing is experimentation. Uh, and, um, you know, we cannot assume that the, the systems or the, the, um, the modes of investment available to us or that dominate the market today are sufficient to addressing both the scope and the complexity of the social and environmental challenges that we face. I mean, we are not going to, uh, uh, undo systemic injustice and inequality, uh, you know, through two and 20 uh, private equity vehicles. And so we need families or, you know, capital deployers who are experimenting in some cases radically with, uh, with new modes of 
uh, investment. And again, families, because of their freedom uh, and their nimbleness, can uh, have unique opportunity to play that experimental role. Love that. Thank you, Sam. It really does like anchor the, the importance and opportunity for families. I get a question a lot. I'm sure you do too. On when we say family office, is there, are there a few things within that office that you see commonly like uh, portfolio foundation, et cetera? Um, or does it just totally vary for anyone on the call who's new to this whole um, family office concept? Yeah, it's a, a a very broad catch-all and uh you know i think that that that's again part of the opportunity and the challenge is that every family is distinct and every family's capital deployment strategy broadly defined is a function of the unique family dynamics the relational dynamics that define that family and the you know to really kind of boring but profoundly important legal structures you know that underpin the way that assets are owned um, within the family and also the institutional relationships uh, that the family has so this stuff is hugely complex and you know i think again uh weasel uh, is often yeah she started saying like okay here's my context you know which is different from others and yeah. my family's context is unique it's it's true for for all of us so it, it can be very hard to generalize and part of the opportunity. With that, we can turn to Renny Hoare. Uh, so you're one of the six partners at, at Hoare's Bank. Um, and as far as I understand, all partners are 11th generation descendants of the bank's founder. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that, I mean, Sam, to your point, that that's going to get complex over that many <laughs> generations there. Um, so Renny, you're the head of philanthropy, um, overseeing the work of the family, the bank, uh, and the customers, um, including the Golden Bottle Trust which is one of Snowball's founding partners, which Laura introduced at the beginning. Um, and I think, you know, after hearing what Liesl and Sam kicked us off with, you bring a slightly different perspective, right? Because you're a part of a family business. And then also looking at the foundation's role in that to be 100% invested for impact, almost to show it's possible, right? And using that as your ground, your space for experimentation. Can you share a bit more about how that's, how that's going and, and how you see the opportunity for, for your family? And Absolutely, and thank thank you for the introduction. Um, certainly for those involved with family offices and family businesses, I don't want to frighten them about the 11th generation. Um, the, the way that we work is um, that it's only the partners working at the bank that are the owners of the business. So um, the founder of the bank had 17 children back in 1672. Um, lockdown wouldn't have been much fun for them. Um, but play it forward, there are 2,400 cousins that we choose from. And so we then filter it down into who's brought into the bank and then who's brought into the partnership. So um, uh, I just thought that was worth explaining, def definitely if there are families on the line. Um, but it means, yes, we've got to nearly 350 years. And we think that, uh, like most families, purpose is absolutely critical. So one thing we did in 1985 was we set up our charitable trust, which sits alongside the business, and that receives up to 10% of the bank's profits each year. And through that, that means that we built up um, grant making expertise. So we, we make about 300 grants a year, but we also have a portfolio of investments that's 100% invested in social impact investments. So that's that's been a, a bit of a journey and i think i think the the thing with impact investment is it's it's taken a decade maybe even a couple of decades to become this overnight success that it is now i, I think people have been been on on the journey for quite some time um we we started in the golden bottle trust by allocating 25 percent of the portfolio uh, to impact investments in 2011 with the Peterborough prison bond, some, some of the sort of early direct investment. So that, that stood us in good stead for, um, for a reasonable amount of time. But in 2016, we realized the benefit of doing things in partnership with other people who are like-minded. And so 
um, alongside a few other charitable trusts, we formed Snowball, which is the multi-asset social impact investment fund that Laura described. I think our, our idea behind Snowball is to really prove out that impact investment works. So we want to grow Snowball to 150 million pounds, lift it, list it as an investment trust and allow retail investors to invest into it. And I think by proving that there's much greater demand for this type of investment, you then get mirrored and copied by other asset managers. And once you're mirrored and copied by other asset managers, you're into the mainstream of how investment decisions are made. And so the objective of Snowball, although starting small, is the way that capital is allocated in markets. And by starting small and proving it, we're actually hoping at that much more systemic change of really taking that intentional environmental and social lens on investing. So um, that's, that's our structural play on changing, um, changing the investment market. And then obviously, because we want to continue with the grant making, we have a, a liquid impact um, set of investments with two discretionary fund managers. So that means that the investments that we're doing are able to be providing good. And I think Liesl's point was, was really important about all investments have both negative and, and positive effects. And we, we definitely, um, inside our charitable trust, were really worried about situations more broadly in charitable trust where you have assets that have been allocated for good. And if you have a traditional investment portfolio, the negative externalities might well outweigh the good that you're doing with your grant making. And that is completely untenable. And so we, we ascribe to this um, model we, we call total portfolio impact, which is where your grant making and your investments are doing good. And the liquid impact um, or part of that portfolio was a way that we were doing good, but also we could um, fund our grants as, as they were needed. Thanks, Renee. It's fascinating how you've gotten that to that total portfolio impact um, approach. And I love the focus on replication, right? And, and sort of creating that systemic change by making it possible for others to do this. This is a question for all of you. Where do you see the main obstacles or, or misconceptions that are, are holding, holding us back from seeing 100% impact portfolios, total impact portfolios from, from being a reality across our networks? I can start, but I, th I think everyone's everyone's going to have their their own perspectives on it. I I think for me, it's quite a lot of people are starting by using the highest risk tools, and when you think about most portfolios, the way that they're composed, they've got a core that ticks over and gives you much more of a steady return, and then you do have those satellite investments around it that give you give you the possibility of much greater returns, but also you, you have to build in the possibility of failure. Where I see a, a lot of people that have gone into impact investment have gone straight to those portfolios of very, very high risk investments mm. without having the stable core. And at the moment, I don't see a huge abundance of the stable core like investments, where I do see much more of the opportunity to get the satellites and I snowball is intended to answer a bit of that need of having something that ticks over at a four percent return um, and you can you can just have that going and then you can put the other things around it yeah I would it, I would agree I think that that one big barrier for this moving forward is um uh, well, and it's something I think, Amanda, you know quite well, would be just how noisy some of the disclosures and data are, particularly on the public side. So when you look at, at how do you think about impact in a publicly traded company, there's many, many different ways to slice that. Um, but 
it's very, it's hard, right? It's a lot easier to be intimately familiar with a small early stage startup than with a huge multinational corporation. And as Rennie just said, most people's portfolios are in sort of public markets or in, in areas where we can't get a handle on, um, on that data in a really great way. Um, and there's also a lot of different um, ways to slice it. So, you know, you know, Facebook doesn't have a big carbon footprint, but has a lot of other problems in, <laughs> in terms of, of its effect on society. And so um, who is right and who is wrong can often, um, I think people get lost in that. And it's a real problem. It, and, and I know there's many people in Europe's way ahead of the US, I think, in terms of thinking about um, from a regulatory side and a disclosure side, how to how to start to make um, to find some signals in that noise. So I think that's that is a big issue. Um, and also, I, I would agree with what Rennie said in this perception that impact investing means early stage, high risk venture. Um, it can, and that's fun, and we have that in our portfolio as well. But we have way more allocated to municipal bonds than we do to early stage um, tech. And muni bonds are kind of like your very original community finance. They're great. They're hugely impactful. If you pay attention to where they're going, how are the communities, um, uh, you know, how are we thinking that, you know, these prices are, are, that the risk is mispriced in these markets based on, you know, systemic racism and how muni bonds are set. Like, there's all sorts of ways to look at that part of your portfolio with the same kind of lens. And, and yes, there's lots of fun stuff over on the VC side, but um, yeah, I think looking, looking at the other asset classes first and then sort of the VC is the dessert. Um, is kind of how I like to think about it a little bit. I like that. <laughs> Just to, uh, to build on that point in a slightly different direction, I think that the part of what's so challenging about families, of course, again, is the family dynamics and just the realities of needing, in many cases, to get groups of people who have complex relationships with each other to agree upon a single strategy. And that's hard in any context. Uh, group decision-making is hard. Group decision-making when you have 2,700 cousins, I imagine <laughs> is a, a particular nightmare. Um, and so I think because of those complex dynamics, you often see families defaulting to convention. And right now convention isn't uh, the kind of higher impact standard that Liesl and Rennie are speaking to. And so I think one of the opportunities for us, again, is to leverage the kind of cultural and institutional influence of families to help shift convention. And if we make, uh, again, you know, sustainable and impact portfolios, the default option at every private bank, for example, and so families have to decide collectively to get out of those portfolios rather than to get into them. Um, that can start to change the dynamics uh, of the market. I'm really interested in that market dynamic, especially when we look at, I mean, finding that signal through the noise, as Liesl said, especially in public markets is getting you know, we're, we're getting some more transparency on some parts of social and environmental impact, but then there's some, some that are still not spoken about. You know, we're digging for the right information at the right time to make the right judgment. And I think one of the interesting parts about what you're saying, Sam, is the family dynamic on top of that, right? It's even, even for an individual to come to terms with what to do with Facebook stock, Liesl, for example, is, is one thing. It's hard. And then to talk to your whole family about those dynamics. I guess a question, my dog is very excited about that. Um, the, the, I guess the question um, that I have is, is this all really on the next gen? You know, we hear a lot of momentum and, and we have this amazing group on this line right now who are trying to change the, 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 the standard, right? And, and really raise it. That said, how is it really on us? Can we afford to wait till all the next gen sort of change the shape of this? And also, where do you guys have examples of 
of, of changes that have been paved in generations before that you're only seeing the fruits of or the results of now? Because uh, I think it, it, there might be some cool stories on this. On this yeah, topic. Well, I can give a very personal, the most personal example of that. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm in this world because of my grandmother and my mother. Uh, you know, my grandmother and her siblings built, you know, a, a global oil and gas and timber business, <laughs> which she was very proud of. And then at the end of her life, she basically directed her grandchildren to get out of those businesses and to figure out what it meant for us to be a mission and values driven entrepreneurial family in a world with a changing and a climate, changing climate and growing inequality. And, you know, my mother began uh, investing her assets in, you know, responsible and then sustainable and then impact investments decades ago. Uh, so I am following in their footsteps. And it's not to say that, you know, my grandmother is now deceased, uh, but not to say that she and I had exactly the same view of how to invest for impact. But there's clear continuity between her vision, again, of values and mission-driven investment and what we're doing today. And it is, of course, the case, I think, in most families that younger generations are driving the conversation. And I think the, the opportunity for them, however you know, hard they may need to dig, is to find ways to connect their vision with the stories uh, that the family has always told about itself and with the vision and the values that preceding generations have worked hard to, to pass on. And I also, just to build on that, there's, there's a narrative that I've seen where, you know, yes, it's, it's, you know, next gen versus, you know, the older generations and we want impact investing and, you know, you're standing in our way and there's a new way of doing things. And again, as Sam said, like that never works. Like that's not a healthy dynamic and you're not, you know, not a terrific negotiating position. Um, but also it's not necessarily true because, um, because what's actually happening is where we have some new information, right? Like there's, there's new information around um, how certain industries are affecting climate change or how certain industries or how we treat employees and the effect that it has on their well-being and on wages and on, you know, we've, we have new information than we had a generation ago. But the values of the family are the same. So essentially what, what I see the next gens doing is being completely consistent and saying, it's because I'm, I'm carrying these values forward that I have to respond to this new information with, with, a, with a bit of a pivot in how we change course because this, this is what our family has always stood for. So, you know, that's, that's to me kind of the way in is that we just, we have some new ideas, there's some new investment opportunities, and this is in keeping with all the values that I have heard from generations back and back. And so that way you're sort of continuing and being creative with this new information as families have always done, not mine for 11 generations, but, <laughs> but a couple. <laughs> so I think, um, and, and that, and and also to be said, I don't. I think um, there are great examples of of older patriarchs leading the way on this. I mean, we see this all the time at the impact. Is that you know sometimes it's it's the dad bringing the son along as opposed to the other way around. So uh, yes, I think there's definitely a push with the next gens, but not exclusively. And I'd, I'd I'd agree with that. And. I think there's there's an even greater danger of saying it's a next gen sort of fascination or movement. Um, it definitely is across the age spectrum. When you look at some of the most successful impact investors, they're they're not millennials. They're they're sort of very serious investors, and that's what they've done through time. They've been doing it for 20, 30 years, rather than it's it's something that has only bubbled up in the last few years. I think the other thing is that advisors in particular, there's this focus on this intergenerational wealth transfer to millennials, and that will be happening over the next 
next decade and onwards, uh, the biggest in history. But in that, the narrative that impact investment is for the next generation means that it can be postponed, it can be put off because it's not a demand that's here right now. And so I, I absolutely feel that this, this conversation around it, it only being next generation is a really, really dangerous one. Um, and certainly something that if we're gonna be serious about um, solving and really getting to addressing the sustainable development goals by 2030, um, we need people to listen now and calling it a next generation thing just doesn't get the impetus behind it. Yeah, it almost allows, it, it could allow for people to say, oh, they're on it. Don't have to worry about what I'm doing over here, which is exactly the opposite of, of what we want to achieve, right, Renny? Um, well, it's, and- it's sort of they're, they're on it. And also there isn't sufficient demand for it right now. It's, right. it's a demand that will bubble up and we will need to, as, as a wealth manager, um, we will have to pivot over time to be able to address it. But I think the demand for impact investment is is here and that's dangerous if people think oh it can be kicked down the road and we we don't need to change so we've talked we've talked a lot about the engagement with with the with with the families and across generations um what about the engagement with your portfolio i'm wondering uh, if all of you also have stories there of it's not just um deciding where you want to go and just voila, the money finds its root (laughs) and the impact is had. There's a lot of also changing behaviors and mindsets with ventures you back or on issues that you care about as a shareholder or um, as a voter. Do you guys have any specific examples you want to share? Also, where do you see, um, well, in, in your specific context, where have you seen some of the most influence and change in your portfolio based on the engagement and the focus that you've that you've developed over time? Don't all rush in. I'd like to go first. <laughs> <laughs> Same, go for it. I'm, I'm happy to share. I, I um, I'll just share what I'm, I've been currently reflecting on. Uh, um, you know, we've been doing within the impact, uh, some of our members are leading uh, a series of learning and doing events focused on issues of racial justice. And one of the things that I'm trying to be, trying to hold myself accountable to is in my own personal portfolio, every single one of my investments is run by a white man. And I, as you know, as switched on as I like to think that I am in these conversations. I think I'm having to recognize that there, there may be some pretty clear biases um, in the way that I'm approaching my own investment. And you know, I remember when I had my first ever conversation about money with my mother and investing, I was feeling very overwhelmed by the prospect. And she just said, you know, Sam, this is a, a process of lifelong learning. And uh, I try to remember that every day. And now, you know, as I reassess my own portfolio and how it's invested, I think I'm seeing the next frontier for myself in terms of my own learning and the, the evolution of my portfolio. And I regret that it took me so long to, to recognize that. But I, I think Liesl put it beautifully, like every day we have new information. <laughs> you know, our understanding of the ways that our money is at work in the world is always deepening and always becoming more complex. And uh, I think the question is, what are we doing in response um, to that ever greater information and that ever more complex information? I think a, a, a couple from, um, from our portfolio, I think one of the things there's our portfolio engagement with you know, funds and, and portfolio companies, but then there's also the um, influencing the advisor piece, which is something also at the impact in the at the impact that we like to do a lot of is sort of like scheme together about ways that we can. <laughs> um, and uh, so with my own, so we work with a team um, at Goldman Sachs, the former imprint team that was acquired by Goldman Sachs in 2015, and they've been really great. Um, and one of the things that we've been working with them on is how do you take some of the kind of impact parameters um, that and and different metrics and just the way of finding investments that imprint has been really good at and sort of like infiltrate 
all of Goldman Sachs on that. And so our portfolio was the first one where, you know, a few years ago, we, 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 we said we want a diversity report on every manager in our portfolio and not just, you know, the racial and gender breakdown, but promotion and, and firing history. Like how many, you know, are people stopping at the manager level? Who's on the IC, you know, don't just tell me how many women there are at the firm, how many investment professionals <laughs> are women at the firm? Like, um, so we got a pretty detailed breakdown of that. And then now it's become part of um, Goldman Sachs' firm wide due diligence questionnaire. So it was never something they were actually capturing beforehand. Um, but now they're like, actually, this is pretty interesting information and maybe we should. Um, and, you know, that kind of question, that coming in a due diligence questionnaire from just like me, some random single family office is not as powerful as it is coming from like Goldman Sachs. And so like that's, that was a great, you know, I like that as well as how do you leverage your um, relationships with your service providers, your, your influence with them to sort of make a greater shift than you could on your own. Um, and then in terms of like portfolio company engagement, one of my favorite things to see, a lot of our portfolio companies are kind of like, you know, they're very mission oriented already. So we don't have to do a whole lot of like, you know, repositioning there. But what I like seeing is where do we find pain points in our investment portfolio that we can then um, use other, you know, uh, philanthropy or other kind of kinds of capital to help um, solve. So you know, we have uh, our direct investment portfolio is focused on fintech, renewable energy and logistics companies in sub-Saharan Africa. And we have about 11 portfolio companies currently. We started that portfolio in, in 2014. Um, and one of the things that, you know, we've, we've, we, we run into a lot is, you um, uh, these are tech enabled companies they're moving quickly into different uh, you know different markets many some of them use you know sort of gig workers or various things like that it's very hard for them to find CHROs so so um, chief human resource officers who know how to run a fast growing tech company and put trainings in place professional developments um, everyone is learning these are jobs you know, they're hiring for jobs they don't even know they need yet that don't exist with skill sets that the market doesn't necessarily have. So companies become the, um, the unit that is upskilling the workers a lot of the time. And that tends to fall on the CHRO. And so we found this problem pervasive, not just in our own portfolio companies, but sort of across the ecosystem. So then we've partnered with some business schools and um, some other sort of really amazing HR firms to build out a leadership course to sort of like focus on this next generation of amazing, like how do you really think about your people at your firm going forward? And how do we make sure that that talent is there on the continent at the leadership level? And so like things like that, that that we funded with our philanthropy, it will probably get to be self-sustaining at some point, but, you know, sort of you can, you, you learn a lot from your own portfolio companies and then that influences, um, you know, our, our philanthropic portfolio. Pass it over to Renny, but I just think one thing that between what Sam said and what you said, Lee, it's so exciting because it's one thing to get more information and just feel like, oh my gosh, we have so much more. We should be doing so much more. But where I'm getting really excited is seeing how much better we're all asking questions, right? Because it's one thing to have information. It's another thing to sort of go that extra step, dig deeper. And in a world where, as you say, Liesl, there's a lot of complexity with disclosures and ratings. The one thing we all can do in our own context, whatever it is, is just like ask that extra question, explore that stuff that's not being spoken about in whatever way we feel we're able. And, and that's changing mindsets, if not behavior yet, at least it's like, God, no one asks, this, no one has ever asked me that. Who knows when I'll be asked again, I should prepare for the future. So I just want to flag that. I think there's a, it's a two way one, there's more information. Sure. But two better questions, um, help us cut through the noise. Um, Rennie, over to you. Well, I think, I think there's, there's maybe an additional bit to it, which is 
the proving that it's possible. And I think what, what you've got on this panel is different examples of proving that impact investment works. I, I think we're obviously here speaking with a whole load of people because they're, they're interested in impact investment and, and feel that it's a, a valid form of going and allocating your capital. But there are large amounts of people that do not believe it's possible. So I actually see that the role that we're taking is the proving that it's it's credible, it's proving that it's possible and the different ways that it can be executed. And so by proving it's possible, we can then go take that message out to people and we can explain and we can unpack the different drivers. I think also with that transparency, you can talk about metrics, you can talk about what are the forms of measurement that you need. And going back to Liesl's point of public equity and people maybe badging things up with the sustainable development goals to show what they're doing, which is good. The next stage of, stage of it is, what are the sustainable development goals that you're blocking by having this in investment? And at the company level, level are you net SDG positive or negative? I, th I think there's, there's a whole load of methodology that comes through being in that space and doing it, but also saying, we're on the journey and we're happy to share the learnings as we go. Thanks. Um, we have one question from the audience, an anonymous attendee uh, that I'm going to throw at you guys. Um, but I'm also going to warn you of my final question, just so you can start thinking. I don't want to pop it on you uh, in the final two minutes, which is, you know, one tip or one thing you wish you knew 10 years ago, like what would have been the, the, the top tip as you were getting started. So I'm going to ask you this at the end, but until then, uh, someone has asked, is there a difference between the way family offices think about impact in Europe, the US, and Asia? And I would sort of expand as well, you know, Latin America, Africa, <laughs> if um, Oceania, if you'd like. But how are you seeing, any of you, a difference in the way um, family offices think about impact in those contexts? I'm going to say no, uh, and uh, because I think that the the fundamental questions are the same. I think families everywhere increasingly recognize that their how they invest is an expression of their values in the world. I think that's true. Full stop. Again, in that idea is you know perhaps more popular in some places than others, but it's I think it's consistent. Second. To Liesl's uh, point, I think families everywhere, whether you are a European family, an Asian family, or Brazilian family, or an American family, the companies you are invested in are creating impact in the world. And so you should be aware of that impact and be intentional about it. And then third, I think families everywhere are interested in using business and finance as a tool to solve the specific social environmental issues that they care about. I think the biggest differences come in terms of like here, you know, in the US, there's, I think, more enthusiasm about using, uh, you know, business as a tool to solve problems in our own backyard. You know, we don't have the advanced social safety net uh, that, uh, you know, European, many European countries enjoy. And so we have to rely on the private sector to provide public goods. I think that, so European families may be less interested in using the private sector to provide public goods in Europe but see the absolute necessity of doing so in other markets in which they are investing. So it's still the same question, you know, how are we using capital effectively to provide uh, essential human services? And it's just a question of where, uh, where the capital is being deployed. I think, I think the only thing I'd, I'd add to that is if there are regional differences, that's going to be problematic. I think the more that we can come to common frameworks around measurement, the more that we can really get what are the core characteristics that, that we have to capture, what, what does intentionality look like, the, the better. And the more you get fragmented regional variances, the more difficult it is to tie things together and really get the momentum behind impact investment as a way of changing mainstream investment markets. 
Fair point, Renny. So there has to be a shared understanding of, of, of what, what good looks like, although, you know, the, the many different strategies that emerge. Sam, I love your point, right? It's, it's, it's focusing on, on what's possible in your portfolio based on your understanding of good and bad. That might vary across continents, but at the end of the day, Renny, we need to be able to, to share uh, what's happening in a way that's consistent. Um, I have one more question um, from, well, two more questions. One is uh, to Renny specifically around um, the whore's wealth management business um, and whether there was, that was ever used to sort of help others, other families invest impactfully or, or how you guys see your role in, I think probably what Liesl was saying on how to encourage others to do this more through the, through, through Horse Bank, um, if you'd like to answer that. And, and then there's another one on public equities. Um, how do we invest in public equities? And Lisa, you brought this up in the very beginning <laughs> in a way where, you know, business models might drive clear impacts, but that doesn't mean practices are up are also do are also good, right? Or vice versa. Practices might be very good, but the product could be very bad. Are there any resources that you found helpful to, to think through the total impact in public equities and overall reporting, how to make that, you know, load of information a bit easier to digest um, at the portfolio level? Big question, no pressure. Um, but Renny, Liesl, Sam, any thoughts? <laughs> Oh, did, should I start on the set yeah. of wealth management and why we why we did that in um, so announced in 2016 and executed in 2017? Um, I th I think it's down to we're we're a private bank. Um, we've been running for nearly 350 years, and when we had wealth management, you're then running two regulated entities. Our desire is to stay intentionally small and personalized and provide an excellent quality of service. If you start having two regulated entities and there's regulation that's needed on top of it, there's the systems change, there's the technology um, spend that's needed, there's a very, very high likelihood that you're spread so thinly that you can't provide the service that's needed. And so by, by being too broad based, actually you end up not doing stuff that's good enough for your customers and their expectations. I think the other side of it, and I, I didn't say it in my opening remarks, is the six of us partners that own it, we have unlimited liability. So all of our personal assets are on, on the line. We played it forward to what does a really successful wealth management business look like tied to the bank? So at least 15, 20 billion pounds of um, assets under management with a bank on the side of it. Does that look like the risk profile of the business that we would like to take? And that expansion of what does success look like also did not um, look a particularly encouraging proposition. And so we, we sold well, the wealth management business in 2017 and we focused purely on the provision of banking. And that's, that seems entirely the correct decision for the longevity of the bank and we're hoping to hand over to the 12th generation a bank that's in a better shape than, than what we inherited. Thank you for being so open about that Renny. Uh, Liesl? So on the, on the public equity question, um, uh, what I would say, so from our standpoint, what we do is um, a lot of the engagement, so we we rely on our active managers um, to do a lot of the company engagement on the public equity side, and there are some really great ones out there. Um, uh, I mean, Generation is you know one of the best known, um, but also one of the top performing. Period. The end. Active managers of like the last fifteen years, um, which you know, is not a coincidence. Um, and, but there are other ones, there's ownership out of Amsterdam that's really, really cool. They spun out of PGGM and um, go to slightly smaller size companies. Um, there's, there are some new ones also popping up um, also that are a little bit more uh, kind of like long only activist funds that are kind of fun um, that we're, we're just starting to invest with as well. And, um, and what sort of they do is they have their kind of 
proprietary way of working with management teams um, to embed some more sustainability practices into their businesses um, and therefore generate alpha over time. And, and we've seen that to be the case, both in down markets and in up markets, which we were not expecting. We thought this would be more downside protection. Um, so we really rely on our active managers on that side. Um, and uh, so that's, that's how we've done. I mean, but we, then we do have kind of a sort of proxy voting overlay with our portfolio that we work with outside providers on and sort of take their advice um, on how we should be engaging in that sense, given, given the things we care about as a family office and what kind of resolutions are on the table. Um, but I mean, there are some broad frameworks. There's obviously impact management project that you know, you could you could look at you know the five dimensions of impact and kind of ask questions that way, which has been really great. Um, I am super excited about uh, the work that's coming out of Harvard Business School around the um, uh, impact weighted accounting. So basically, um, what I like about this is how do you get um, ESG and impact metrics out of CSR out of the marketing department and over to the accounting and legal department, um, which is, I think, really, really where you're going to get the attention. Um, uh, so that's and, and how does that relate to financial performance? So the materiality of very specific metrics. Um, but there, that project's kind of just getting going, which which I'm so excited about. Um, so yeah, they're releasing yeah. stuff as they go. We have a while to go, as you say, but but some. Uh, some early research if anyone. Yeah. So, so, I mean, so that's, that's how we've done it is really uh, um, relied on our active managers for that kind of support. Okay. Guys, we're almost out of time. Uh, and thank you again for all this incredible insight. I know I've learned a lot and I'm sure uh, all of the audience has too. So a rapid fire final round of top tip or bit of advice you wish you'd received approximately 10 years ago. That's okay if you go a little more, a little less. <laughs> Anyone want to go first, Sam? Sure. Uh, I'll quote the three of you, actually. Uh, first, one of my favorite things I ever heard was from Liesl describing her strategy as ready, fire, aim. <laughs> and uh, I just love that. And I think in, you know, in seriousness, action begets action. And so do things, learn from them, do more of them or pivot based on the learnings. And to Rennie's point earlier, don't start with the hardest stuff, start with the, you know, the easier and accessible stuff. That doesn't necessarily mean boring, you know, start with the interesting accessible stuff uh, and progress from there. And then Amanda, as you said, you know, just asking questions is essential and asking questions is an action that begets further action. Thanks, Sam. Ready? The one thing that is absolutely clear about the impact investment marketplace is people are incredibly generous with their time and their information. And so don't feel you have to become an expert yourself through reading and, and doing lots of research get plugged into networks, people are so happy to share their expertise. And I think with that, that will give you the confidence to go and get on. And I, I do completely agree with Sam as well. There, it may seem frightening to take the first step, but just take it and you'll learn a huge amount by, by doing that. Thanks, Rennie and Viva. Yeah, I mean, a variation on ready, fire, aim. Um, it, it, yeah, perfect is the enemy of the good. Like you just, you will need to make decisions without perfect information. Um, and that's actually how we all make money. Like that, that's how the regular investment world works. Um, and, and the impact investing world is no different. And so um, I think that's, uh, uh, you know, I think asking for a higher higher degree of certainty in the impact investing market will will almost always stall you. Um, and so I think that um, yeah, just starting start and iterate and start and iterate. Not everything has to be perfect. But I'd also agree with Rennie that um, 
this space, I find it to be extremely collaborative and a lot of people are very, um, yeah, very happy to share and excited to, to, to collaborate with people who are coming in, so. Yeah. You guys rock. Thank you for your time. Thank you to Snowball and Bethel Green Ventures for making this possible. And uh, thank you all for, for joining. I hope you all have happy holidays and um, on to more impact in 2021. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Bye. Bye.